welcome, welcome. Hallelujah. 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 Welcome, dear ones. Hope you're doing okay where you're at. Uh, some feedback would be good to see how we are doing on the volume. Um, I hope we, I hope I'm coming through okay. I think I am, but uh, it's always good to hear it from those watching. Thank you, thank you. I'm getting some feedback that it's clear. We bless the name of the Lord. Let's pray and get into today's installment. Father, in the holy and mighty name of Jesus, we worship you, we exalt you, we honor you this moment and always. Thank you for an opportunity to come on air again to share your word. Thank you, Lord, for your power in your word to change and transform our lives. Lord, to be more like you and to be more aligned with your kingdom purposes. We thank you and honor you and we invite you, Holy Spirit, good teacher to show us the way to elaborate the things of god to our spirit man in jesus name we pray and believe amen all right dear saints and uh curious people and whoever else would find their way to watch this video we are in our installment uh thank you thank you i'm getting feedback we're doing okay we are continuing with our installment on miracles. Today's part three of that series. I'm calling it Miracles Part C. How miracles happen and why are we not seeing many miracles today as the days of Jesus and the early church. So it's a very, very important lesson. It is very um, on time and it is to help us better align ourselves with the purposes of God so that we can experience the fullness of what God has for us in our day and in our generation. You see, the thing about it is God has not changed. He says in Malachi 3 and verse 6 that I am the Lord and I change not. Hallelujah. So if God is the same as he was, in the days of Abraham to give him a son when he was past childbearing age, if God is the same as he was in the days of Elijah when he could cause there to be a drought for three and a half years and famine across the land, but be able to sustain the widow and his son and the prophet, the man of God, if he has not changed as he was in the days of the early church where even handkerchiefs from Paul's body could go and heal and deliver people from demonic powers, how and why is it that we are not seeing those kinds of miracles on a scale as happened back then in our day? Of course, there are miracles happening. I told you I have personally experienced them, and I'm seeing them, even as we continue to learn about this. And, and, and we're learning it so we can see more of it. And um, so miracles are still happening, but why is it that it's not on such a large scale as it used to be? And that's the lesson today. So we have prayed, and I have our main text up there, the word of God coming out of the book of Mark, uh, chapter 6, verse 6, verse 4 through 6. And it says, uh, maybe I'll get to that. Let me back up a little bit. So, so um, what we, we've already described what miracles are. You know, the, the, the um, unlikely and unexpected things that happen due to divine intervention not based on our scientific progression not based on the changes that we have seen in our generation but specifically something that is caused by the hand of God something that cannot be explained any other way 
but it's good and it's pleasant and it is welcome, such as healing, such as restoration of a paralyzed arm, such as a return from death, something that is welcome. And it's only by the hand of God. That's what we are calling a miracle. And, w and, and in the previous sessions, you know, we talked about what miracles are. We talked about uh, 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 examples of miracles, you know, from creation to, to maintenance of creation as God has set it in motion to, you know, providential miracles. We've talked about all that. But I want us to, to, to think about how, what exactly, what is really the mechanism behind a miracle? What is really, what has to be in place for a miracle to happen? That's what I'm going for today. What exactly has to be in place for some laws of nature to be suspended so as an intervention that is pleasant and welcome to a person can be achieved? Hallelujah. And so, right up front, I want us to get in the mind that miracles happen as a result of God's intervention in an atmosphere of faith and expectancy. Miracles happen by God's hand of intervention or finger of intervention in an atmosphere of faith and expectancy. Miracles don't just happen because I want them to happen. Number one, they, they, they are God's intervention. And there has to be an atmosphere of faith and expectation. I have to be believing God and expecting God to move. Hallelujah. But how, what, what is it that's going to drive him to move? That is the part you and I need to get very clearly today. It is not me conjuring something and expecting God to work on it or to, to manifest it. It is simply the belief in God's rema word for the circumstance or for the situation. And by rema word, I mean God's determined will in that situation in that time. So I may come to God with a headache, and yes, his logos word says, I am the Lord that healeth you. But in this moment and in this time, what does God want to do about my headache? In this moment and in this time, what does God want to do about my financial situation? See, this is where Christians, we get so mixed up. We think just because God told Peter, go fish, and the first fish you pull out, there'll be a coin to pay your tax and mine. You, you go out to fish, and you expect God to put money in a fish's mouth. You may be expecting God to work, but is that based on his rema? Is that based on the counsel of his will for that situation, for that time, for that moment? And this is where we need to spend a lot of time seeking God, to understand what is your will in this situation. And I'll get to why sometimes God doesn't heal everybody. Sometimes, sometimes God even heals people that want really believing him deeply for the healing. And it's based on the counsel of his will. His rema word in that moment. Yes, God can heal any sickness. He can heal any, any disease. But why is it that even Elisha himself fell sick before he died? He was the prophet of God. And he ministered to many who received healing. But why did Elisha die of an illness? Wasn't God able to heal him? Of course he was. God could have prevented Jesus from going to the cross. In fact, Jesus talking to Peter, he says, I could call my, on my father and he would send millions and millions of angels and they would take care of this crowd without a problem. But why did Jesus have to go on the cross? Why didn't he just rebuke 
the men who came to arrest him. You know, he, 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 they show up and they want Jesus, and he asks them, who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus. And he says, I am he. And then they fall before him, struck by the anointing that was on Christ. They are perplexed. They are astounded that this is the Christ they want to arrest. There is such a power around him that they fall down. They do that three times only to get up and go arrest him. Why? Why wasn't Jesus able to call on the angels, like he said, to stop them? Because that was not God's rema. That was not his counsel of his will for that situation. Many of us beat ourselves head over shoulder. Many of us uh, uh, fast on endless because we want God to do this. We want God to do this right now. Right now, Lord. If you don't do it right now, then don't ever do it again. Uh, God is looking at you and going, that's not my rhema word for your situation right now. That's not my rhema word. It is the logos. It is still within the confines of my written word. I can heal. I can save, I can liberate, I can deliver. It is still in the logos. But is it the rema? Is it the now word for that situation? And so faith is not just faith in the written word. Faith is faith in the rema word that God has said about this situation. And that's where we need to spend our time as believers, seeking the will of God in this situation. Seeking the will of God concerning me about where I need to go live, about where I need to go to school, about where I need to take my children, about what I need to buy or not buy. That's where we need to have our time spent. Faith in the Rema word and the expectancy thereof that God will do what he said he will do. That's why Abraham and Sarah are able to wait on God because he had promised. And even though they went past their childbearing age and for some moment they veered off course a little bit and got the Ishmael factor into their, into their life, they still had to wait for the promise of God. And so, so faith in the Rema word holds expectantly even if the circumstances around dictate otherwise. It has to be faith in the Rema word, not faith just in the complete logos of God. It has to be faith in what God has said about this situation. Remember, I keep taking you back to the example of Abraham. When he is Abram, before he is changed into Abraham, he looks at God in prayer and he says, Lord, you have given me all this land. You have given me servants. You have given me all these riches, but I do not have an heir to my estate. And God says, I'll give you a son from your own bosom, but through Sarah. And that was Rema word for that situation. That was God's prevailing counsel of his will in that situation. And so it didn't matter that Abram went to get Ishmael and Isaac had to come and from Sarah's womb, not any other womb. And that's where the faith of Abraham becomes important for us to emulate. When we say we stand on the promises of God, yes, it is the logos, but even more, more uh, uh, precisely, the rema promises of God in our situation. The word for that season, the word for that situation, the word for that circumstance. And so let's read real quick. Mark chapter 6 and verse 4 through 6. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Now, he could do no mighty work there except that he laid hands, his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. 
Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. So Jesus is at this one village, and he intends very well to perform miracles there. That is his desire. That is his prevailed counsel of his will. However, that fails to manifest because of the unbelief in this village. And he himself even marvels. He is astounded at the level of unbelief these people have. He even goes on to say, a prophet does not have honor in his own country. In other words, these people are so familiar with me that they cannot see past our familiarity to receive the counsel of God concerning them. So the, the important thing is faith. But along with faith, it has to be coupled with the rema counsel of God's will in that situation. When the two marry, miracles happen. When the two come hand in hand, miracles happen. When the two can walk together, they agree to walk together. Faith in the hand of expectancy of the revealed will of God, then miracles happen. I hope I'm helping you understand how miracles happen. And for the rest of this installment today, we will get deeper into why they don't happen. Of course, in part because we don't have faith. And in part because we do not Believe and seek to know the rema word in our situations. See, we cannot bypass that. We cannot bypass that. Some of us want to believe God for a million dollars in the bank. Not that God can't do it, but is that a rema revelation? Is that his revealed will in your situation? Or you just want to go after these TV preachers and say, I receive, I receive. Every word they say, you say, I receive. Is it really for you? It may be for somebody in the congregation, but is that for you and your situation? You can't just go up here, you know, grasping at every word that is released. It is for somebody. I don't dispute that. But is it for you? Some of us are here receiving husbands. We are receiving money in the bank. We are receiving children, this and that. We are receiving. You can't be receiving all these things. Some of them are not meant for you. God help us. Have you sought God for what his will is in your situation? That's what you need to be receiving. That's what you need to be believing God for. Not everything else. What has God said about your children? What has God said about your business? And by the way, that is not something somebody has to tell you. That is something you receive from God in your place of prayer with him. When he reveals his mind to you, just like he tells Abram, I've shown you Canaan land, but your children will return here in their fourth generation to inhabit it forever. So Abraham could have prayed all he wanted to remain in Canaan. And he tried for some time, but he had to leave and go to Egypt. And then his, his son Isaac had to move around. And then Jacob, and then Jacob went to e e Egypt and then came back. You see, God had revealed to Abraham what his plan was for him. And so Abraham could afford now to believe God to bring back his children in their fourth generation. Yes, God had given Canaan to them. But between Abraham and the Joseph generation, there was a lapse of time when Canaan did not belong to them. Some of us are trying to hold on to things that do not yet belong to us, and they hurt us. 
We need to be in the right place at the right time. Then we can believe God and expect him to work and move. When you are believing God for something in the wrong season, it is folly. And no wonder it doesn't manifest. When it is the right season and you fail to believe God for that, then you delay getting into your blessing. It's also folly. There has to be an atmosphere of faith and of expectancy based on the Rema word of God for that situation. That's when miracles happen. Hallelujah. Think about the, the prophets. For example, Samuel. You know, before he anoints Saul, king over, over Israel, God reveals it to him the night before. And he says, I'm going to bring you the man who should be king over Israel. Now, before Samuel can anoint Saul, before Samuel can proclaim this word over Saul, he has to be sure this is the Rema word before he releases it. Some of us, prophets of God, we need to be very careful. We are releasing words prophetically over a people that God has not told us to release the word to. I'm very, I try to be very careful with the words that I speak. Because I know I minister in the prophetic. And I don't want to utter something presumptuously. And I don't want to utter something carelessly in the wrong season or to the wrong crowd. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. And some of us have given words to people. And then when they didn't come to pass, they're wondering if you are a true prophet or a false prophet. In part because... The two didn't mix. The two did not mix. The Rema word and the faith did not walk hand in hand. The two have to go together for the miracles to happen. Let me give you an example. Hallelujah. Jesus meets two blind men. Bless the name of the Lord. We, we can get the story in Matthew 9, 27 to 31. Jesus, when Jesus... Dis, I mean, departed from there. Two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? He poses a question. Do you believe that I am able to do this? He is ascertaining their faith, their level of faith. They say to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. You see, Jesus has just asked them, do you believe? And they say they do. So suppose they were lying, then they would not have seen. Because he says, he releases the Rema word that is conditional to their faith. And so he says, according to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. But when they had departed, they spread the news about him in all that country. What am I saying? I'm saying, this man followed Jesus for a while. You ever wonder why Jesus wouldn't address them at the very moment they first started following him? Instead, he goes on, I don't know for what length of distance, but we are told that he departed. And two blind men followed him. We are not told how long they followed him. Maybe it was the time required for their faith to grow to a level of receiving their miracle. I don't know. Maybe. Or maybe it was that it had to be in the right setting, in the right atmosphere, for the Ramawad to be released. You and I, ministers of God, cannot just go around releasing words, you know, haphazardly. We can't just go around uttering prophetic words to people, to crowds of people, carelessly. There has to be a faith expectant enough to capture that word 
and settle it. There has to be a faith. And along with that faith, that word has to be accurate and in the right setting. Of course, the word of God will never return to him void. Of course, the word of God will accomplish the purpose for which he, God Almighty, has sent it. But sometimes we are trying to, to, to coerce the word to accomplish our purpose, not the purpose of God. We are trying to coerce the spirit of God to accomplish our purpose and not the word of God. We have to be careful about that. So that's how miracles happen. There has to be faith and there has to be a rema word for that situation. And the two marry and produce miracles. You see, faith is not positive thinking. It's not just me focusing on the good in any given situation. Oh, I'm blind, but I believe that I can see and... and, and, and or not I can see, but, but, but I'm glad that I can't see so I don't, I'm not tempted with the things of this world. You, you know, that's one way to focus on the positive in your situation. You're blind, but you're grateful that you're blind because you won't be tempted by shopping at Macy's. Huh? That's, some of, that's how some of us phrase our situations. This is not, that's not faith. Faith is not positive thinking in your situation. Faith also doesn't mean ignoring the reality you see, Abraham did not re ignore his, his reality. He didn't ignore the fact that he was growing past childbearing age. The woman, the widow woman and her son did not ignore the fact that her jar of flour was only a half, was only for one meal. She knew the reality. She understood what that meant. So faith does not ignore the reality. Faith in Rema Wad is also not auto-suggestion. As some people do in self-hypnosis. You know, they, they tell, they, they focus on something mentally and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it until their emotions start following that thing. That is not faith. And that is not the Rema Wad of God. That is auto-suggestion from the pits of hell. Positive thinking at best is from the pits of hell. Faith is asking God, what is your will in this situation? And God giving you what his will is. And then you believing that and holding on to that word regardless of what your circumstances say. See, it is not for me and I, you, you and I rather, you and I to decide what needs to happen. It is for God to decide what needs to happen in this situation. And then we hold on to that. We hold on to that. When you think you can order your own steps, you can decide your own destiny, when you think you can formulate things and make them happen, that's idolatry. That is you becoming your own God. That is new age. What Christians and believers do is we ask God, what is your will? What is your purpose? What did you ordain before the foundations of the earth to happen in this situation? And then we hold on to that. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. And so this blind people follow Jesus, and then he asks them, do you believe? And they say we can, and we do. And then he says, according to your faith. So what are the things that hinder miracles in our day? Number one, we already talked about it at length. Unbelief. 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 Not believing. Not believing Jesus. You see, part of the issue is we operate in carnal wisdom. We operate largely in the learning of our day. And the Bible says that 
the things of God are divinely designed, discerned. They're not, the carnal mind cannot receive the things of God. Help me, Holy Ghost. I'm trying to get this verse right. Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But the natural mind does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14. Hallelujah. You see, unbelief sometimes is created because we believe the natural wisdom more than we believe the divine power of God. And we have to be careful about the learned mind. Contemporary Western mindset objects to the miracles. It mocks the idea of rational, educated people believing in miracles. Trust me, there have been many that have asked me, you're a physician, how, how could you believe these Christian things? First and foremost, I was a believer before I became a physician. And I'm not about to cast my Jesus out because of the learned mind of being a physician. God is God. He was, he is, and he is to come. These things we see now will pass away. All the certificates and the licenses and whatnot will pass away. They will be consumed up, and they sure are not going to mean anything in the world to come. But Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever, will be there. And I want to be there with him. So the learned mind, and it's because, because sometimes the ways of God are completely, completely, diametrically opposed to what the learned mind holds on to. I'm not opposed to learning, but I want you to be aware that sometimes the things of God are completely opposite of what you've learned in school. And especially nowadays, when we've got this old mess going around, on around in our, in our society, you really have to be careful about these so-called learned people. They are enemies of the cross of Jesus, and we have to call them for what they are. Large, a large proportion of the learned people are enemies of the cross of Jesus. So unbelief, a lack of belief in the things of God. And how do you go past unbelief? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In other words, you cannot separate faith from the word of God. Faith does not exist outside of the word of God. When, it, when we're talking about faith in Jesus. Faith in God is based on the word of God. It comes by hearing God through his word. So you and I have to devote our time to studying the word of God. We have to devote our time to praying and fasting. When you read that story in Mark um, 9, Jesus is coming down the Mount of Transfiguration and, and people are, they have a commotion there and they can't cast this demon out of this youngster and, and even his disciples can't. And then he tells them that some of these things cannot go except by prayer and fasting. So saints, this is one problem we have in the church. People are not praying and people are not fasting. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the Satanists are fasting. Meanwhile, the witches are fasting, and you think you're going to be able to undo and overdo their work? No, 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 no. No, don't deceive yourself. And I'll be lying to you here to tell you, oh, you can just fast TV. No, you need to fast TV, you need to fast food. Hallelujah. Some of us are so sneaky. We're like, oh, you don't have to fast food. You, just, you can just fast being off the TV for a week. Yeah, fast that. In fact, I don't turn the TV on in my house. My kids watch TV. And sometimes I'm like, turn that thing off. I don't watch TV. 
except on rare occasions. I don't have time for that. I don't have time for garbage in my mind. I don't have time to fill me, space to, to fill with that garbage in me. I only have time for Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. And so we need to make time to pray and to fast and to read the word of God. Not just read, but study. That's what he told Timothy, Paul speaking. He said, study to show yourself approved. A workman that does not need to be ashamed. In other words, if you do not study, you will be a workman that will be ashamed. You'll be quoting things out of context. You'll be quoting words without power and authority behind them. A workman that's ashamed. You'll be ashamed. In the days that we're in and we're headed into, you can't just be going around quoting scripture. It needs to come out with power and authority to be able to effect anything. Hallelujah. I think this lesson is getting longer again. I need to wind up. So we've talked about unbelief. Number two, why we're not seeing many miracles in our day? Familiarity with the messengers of God. You see, Jesus says a prophet is not without honor except in his own town. In other words, he's honored everywhere else except his hometown. Why? People are so familiar with him or her that they take him for, for granted. They don't see past their mundane familiarity and recognize the voice of God to them. They take him for granted. We have to be careful with familiarity and taking men and women of God in our lives for granted. God help us, amen? We already talked about the learned mind, the carnal mind not receiving the things of God. That is one reason why we're not seeing miracles. We are so carnal. I think it's time we started to purge out that leaven and started to put in the righteousness of God, put in the word of God, put in the wisdom of God, put in the spirit of God. Purge out the leaven, the sin, making excuses, for our unrighteous living. And some of us are so cunning. We like to say, you know, we're not perfect. Of course, me who's speaking to you is not perfect. But I'll never make excuses for my sin. No. When I'm wrong, I'm wrong. When I've sinned, I've sinned. I go before God and I say, God, help me. Oh, I'm struggling here. And for some people, I ask them for forgiveness. I humble myself to the point of going to ask for forgiveness. I've asked my children for forgiveness. Praise God. I'm not perfect, but I'm sure not going to make excuses for my sins. Bless the name of Jesus. And I already say prayerlessness and lack of fasting in the church. God help us, right? Yes, we need to be a people that fast. We need to be a people that pray you know jesus was telling the parable i think it's in luke 18 of the this widow who kept pestering his ru her ruler to to hear her on on an issue with her son and and uh she kept going and going and finally the the ruler decided i am tired of this woman and it doesn't look like she's about to stop coming to bother me and pester me i'll just give her what she wants so she can leave me Excuse me, so she can leave me alone. And then Jesus asks, if that ruler being evil, not caring what this widow was going through, but just did it out of convenience for himself, how much more will God avenge us when we pray? That is in Luke 18, um, verse 7. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? Sometimes God bears long with us. But he is so determined to do the things that we're crying to him about day and night. In other words, are you praying day and night? Hallelujah. Are we praying day and night? I should ask myself that too. Hallelujah. And Jesus asked a question, a very, very important question in verse 8 of that chapter. When the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Will he really find a people that are believing him? 
to return. There are people right now who've already given up on the return of the Lord. And he's asking when he comes back, will he still find a people who are still waiting for his return? Will he find people who are still calling on to him to avenge them? Will he still find a people who are still crying out to him day and night? Father, in the name of Jesus, help us. Even as you've taught us today how miracles happen, oh, that we would be a people of faith and a people of the word who can understand your counsel and your will in every situation and pray accordingly. Lord God, I pray that we will walk in that understanding every single day of our lives. And Father, as you have helped us see why miracles don't happen because of our unbelief, our prayerlessness, our lack of fasting, our learned mind and dependence on the wisdom of man. Lord God, our familiarity with scripture and with your men and women in our day and in our generation. Father, I repent on my behalf and on behalf of my Christian brothers and sisters. I repent for these things that we make excuses for, and yet they are limiting your power in us. Oh, that we would arise as an army of God with a new understanding and ready to experience the miraculous of God in our generation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, dear ones. I'm going to stop there. Like I said, it's been a long, long lesson, but may the Lord help.